Anderson is certainly well known to many of you in the Philadelphia area. Uh, she is a public policy uh, consultant who works uh, with nonprofit organizations on a wide range of issues, including artificial intelligence, um, civic technology, voting rights, and cultural heritage preservation. Um, she's had uh, she she's led voter education workshops in Angola and Kazakhstan, and she's observed elections in Ethiopia and Nigeria. Um, Perhaps best known uh, to us here, Faye is director of All That Philly Jazz, a place-based public history project that is documenting and contextualizing Philadelphia's golden age of jazz. Um, the project lies at the intersection of art, preservation, and community engagement. Faye is a, a graduate of Stanford University. Uh, Aaron well Wunsch, also well known to, to many of you, uh, teaches here with us in the program um, at the Weizmann School of Design. He's an architectural historian um, and a preservationist. Um, Aaron's uh, teaching and research focuses on, a, on broad aspects of the American cultural landscape from commercial architecture to cemeteries and suburbs to cartography and the idea of landscape itself. Um, I'll stop there. Um, we have uh, provided some suggested readings uh, for those of you joining today. Uh, we hope you've been able to, um, to look at those um, and inform the questions which um, I ask you to please put in chat uh, and uh, both Faye and Aaron will review those um, after their conversation uh, for response. Okay, with that, um, Aaron, Faye, the screen is yours. All right. Uh, thank you, Frank, for that introduction. And I realize we're all gathered at at lunchtime, thus the informality of this conversation. But thank you all for joining us. And to Frank's introduction, I will simply add that I have, uh, I guess, been an observer and fan of Faye's work since about 2015. Uh, I'm very glad that she could join us uh, today. Um, and without listing any more biography, I'll simply say there, there are two aspects of her uh, approach to preservation advocacy that I, I particularly admire. Uh, one is her, her willingness to speak truth to power in a city where uh, the preservation community has largely gotten out of that habit. And we can talk about what I, what I mean by that later on. Uh, the other is her refusal to make the classic Philadelphia mistake of confusing what is for what must be. Uh, and I think Faye knows what I mean by that. Um, so I look forward to, uh, to having her uh, elaborate as well. Uh, and from Frank's brief biographical uh, introduction, you know that music lies at the center of uh, a lot of Faye's work. It's the, the uh, maybe organizing principle of her earliest work in preservation here in Philadelphia, though by no means the exclusive focus. Uh, and Faye, I thought maybe that would be a, uh, a starting point for our conversation today, uh, the relationship between, between music and preservation, uh, both as you think about them in the abstract and as you uh, make that connection here in Philadelphia. Okay, first of all, thanks for inviting me. Um, music, where do I start? Music is really at my core. Music got me out of, I grew up in Bedford-Stuyvesant, pre-gentrified Bedford-Stuyvesant. So music is so central to everything I do. I probably bore folks with there's always a song that I can bring up, but specifically with um, historic preservation. Now I am what the National Trust for Historic Preservation describes as an accidental preservationist. I'm not trained in historic preservation, um, but my, but as a public policy consultant, this is what people don't um, realize with me is that my day job informs my advocacy. And so I'm paid to know where the pressure points are. I'm paid to know how to get things done. And so when I put on my preservation hat, I'm really being my own client. And unlike a lot of clients, I actually listen to myself 
and follow my own advice. So I've, I've had a lifelong love of old buildings, but again, having grown up in, um, in Bedford Cyrus and no exposure to this could be a possible career path, I just like looking at them and, and really did not go beyond just admiring the beauty of, of old buildings and wondering what stories they held. Um, Again, here comes the music. If walls could talk, what would they tell us about, about those places? And so one day, just walking along um, Lombard Street in um, Center City and past historical marker that says when Billie Holiday was in town, she often stayed here. Now, Billie Holiday is my girl. Uh, one of the first fights I got in, in um, in Philadelphia was wondering, where was the Billie Holiday Walk of Fame plaque? You know, the plaques that line um, South Broad. I'm, I'm walking up and down the street and I'm looking, where's Billie Holiday? She was nowhere to be found because folks did not, kn did not know that she was born in Philadelphia. So that was my first um, win. Um, as it were. So with the Billie Holiday historical marker, I was intrigued, lived here, what's, what's here? And so I went behind the marker, beyond the marker, and much to my delight to find out that here is actually there. You know, oftentimes with the historical marker, there's no there there, but in this case, where she lived, um, stayed when she was in town was the Douglas Hotel at 1409 Lombard Street. The building is still there. It's been repurposed into the offices of, um, of, a, of a nonprofit. And so, yeah, so with um, Billy Holiday got me into historic preservation. Okay, so let me, let me, uh, push a little further on that one because you say you got into the field because you loved looking at buildings and then in Philadelphia you you stumbled on the Billy Holiday story and were delighted to discover that their actual the building that went with that story was still there so that's part of where I, I wanted to head with this because of course you know music by definition is sort of the ultimate abstraction right there's no there's nothing material about it uh but there was something I think it's safe to say more satisfying to you about discovering the fact that there was actually this building there still as well. Um, and it seems to me, you know, in the case of someone like Billie Holiday or John Coltrane or others that we'll, I'm sure, discuss today, you have the music as part of their legacy, but you care about place too. And you care about uh, the, the, the places these people's lives played out. And in some cases, we have uh, the building, um, fewer and fewer of those, but we still have them. In other cases, we have a mural. And it seems to me there is often an impulse in Philadelphia to let the building go, but then put up a kind of commemorative mural uh, that says uh, so-and-so was here, or maybe doesn't even directly connect the place to the person and uh, but 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 celebrates the person. I'm wondering uh, of these three things: the music, the physical, the physical building, and the mural. What what sort of speaks to you uh, loudest, or what combination of uh, of things speaks to you uh, most as a preservationist and preservation advocate? Now you all will probably not like <laughs> what I'm about to say. But I'm not really into brick and mortar. I'm into stories. And to, to the extent that space holds those stories, I want to preserve that space. For me, a vacant lot holds the space. That there's a vacant lot at the corner of Broad and Carpenter. You may know that um, McDonald's is there across from the High School for Performing Arts. So that vacant lot used to be um, the headquarters of Union Local 274, the Black Musicians Union, whose members included I mean, all, who's who, John Coltrane, Dizzy Gillespie, 
Nancy, um, Nina Simone, you name them, all of the giants were members of Union Local 274. There was a black, a separate black union because they were not allowed to join um, the um, Local 77 of the American Musicians. Um, and so one day I was out walking. This is in the before times, obviously. I was out walking. The, 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 this historical marker there noting that that used to be, that Union Local 274 was there and it includes John Coltrane and Dizzy Gillespie in the, on the text. And, but, so there's a gate. So I've never been able to stand in the footprint of that building. And I have, um, uh, from the city records, I haven't, I know what the building looks like. So one Sunday I'm out walking and the gate is open. Oh, I was so happy. So finally, I was able to stand in this vacant lot in the footprint of where that building used to be. So I felt their presence. And so in the hierarchy of things, of course you want to save the, um, the building. But when you mention uh, murals, murals, they, they come and go. I tell you, there's always a song. So one time, in fact, I was giving, uh, I was giving, talking somewhere. And after my remarks, I had a slide of the John Cole, the tribute to John Coltrane mural that was on um, 33rd and, and Diamond. So after the presentation, the person came up to me and said, well, you know, that mural has been demolished. And I'm going to say, well, no, because if I know that, I certainly would not have included it. So the next day, I, I walked over there. And as I was walking, I was hearing, walking the back streets and crying. I said, there's always a song. And so um, where the mural used to be was now what it looked like to me, a freshly dug grave. And no one knew what happened. No one, of course, I talked to the people in the community. No one knew what happened. Long story short, it turned out that um, Penrose had demolished it and um, they were not going to replace it. So for about two, three years, I did what I do, made noise. And even when the Pope was in town, I asked the Pope to pray for Penrose because we there is in San Francisco, the church of John Coltrane. So of course I asked them to pray. And I guess when they finally realized I wasn't going to go away, they, they uh, made a substantial sizable donation to mural arts. And then that mural was replaced in 2018. Fast forward to today, the why we love John Coltrane mural is now blocked. So murals is uh, definitely not the answer. It has to be an appreciation of what these places represent. And that's what's missing that since we're talking about John Coltrane, let's go right to the John Coltrane house. Um, that the property, you want to put that um, slide up, the property adjacent to the John Cole train house, 1509, 1509 North 33rd Street, the, the property with the um, window out there. Um, Aaron, you can probably, you know, you know better how that notice of demolition um, appeared, not appeared, but how it was noticed. So you want to, to tell us about that and then I'll continue. So I, I don't have a lot to elaborate on that. Uh, uh, Brad Mall, uh, famous from, from Hidden City, among other venues, and a great photographer, uh, noticed this uh, just on his way down the street one day and uh, drew uh, attention to it uh, through the, uh, the website and Facebook page of Repoint, uh, local preservation group. And uh, that you found it, though. That, that I uh, co founded. Co founded, uh, okay. And this, I think, you know, is actually the way a lot of people learn about a building under threat. They know really very little about it until this uh, sort of dreaded orange notice appears. Uh, and then in, by most, in most cases, it's too late. Uh, though, as I think uh, Faye and I were discussing not long ago, um, 
when it comes to really important historic resources, don't assume it's too late. Don't assume that you can't do something. And indeed, uh, with, with Faye's help, uh, the cry went out to change something here and to get the city to really look closely at what was going on. And I think at least in the short run, we've, uh, we've slowed the process down. That um, what, what we pointed, they um, posted the notice, um, the image, the photo on social media, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook with a, with a statement. And, and of course I went ballistic because in 2020, the John Cole train house, which is north of that, um, the adjacent adjoining property. In 2020, the John Cole train, I nominated, well, I guess in 2019, I nominated, but in 2020, the John Cole train house was, was listed on the 2020 preservation at risk. And it was nominated in part because of the condition of the adjoining property. Um, again, 1509, the, the, the property with the notice of demolition. And so of course I went ballistic. Those, those um, row houses were built together. The best way to think of them conjoined twins that here it is, it would be akin to someone taking an ax or uh, to an ax or whatever to the Liberty Bell, uh, splitting it down the middle. It's like, are these people crazy? That, that the John Cole train house, in addition to being listed on a local register, which gives the historical commission um, jurisdiction, it's listed on a local register, it's listed on the national register of historic places. And it's also in 1999, it was designated a national historic landmark. And as you all know, that is the highest designation for an historic property. We have is one, the John Cole train house is one of 67 in, um, in, uh, in Philadelphia. So it's like, are you nuts? You're gonna have someone, all we knew at that time was this LLC had, had bought it, that this LLC, this faceless, nameless, well, I guess it had a name, but faceless LI, LLC was just going to come and just start whacking away at this National Historic Landmark and the Historic Commission has nothing to say about it, that if someone, if a property owner in Society Hill wants to change a window frame, they have to come before the commission and jump and go through hoops. And so here you have a property with which it shares a party wall, you can look at it and, and see that they were built together and the historical commission has nothing to say about it. So, you know. <laughs> so, right, and I, just, to, just to clarify, so the, the John Coltrane house is, is adjacent or is in this block. It is, it, is not, uh, it is not the subject of the demolition notice here, but as Faye points out, when you start pulling apart this row, uh, eventually you lose all context for the Coltrane House and maybe destabilize it as well. Uh, and, as, and as people like Inga Safran have, have written in, in recent months, uh, this pattern of sort of death by a thousand cuts where Philadelphia loses uh, one row house and then another and then another, and then the whole block is getting chewed to pieces. That's something we really uh, need to be developing tools to, to deal with. And right now it's uh, it's really still working the way this particular scenario worked. The, re the orange flag goes up and people uh, suddenly reach out and try to figure out what, if anything, uh, they can do. But Faye, I'm going to go back here for a second because you say you're not a bricks and mortar preservationist. But in fact, you care intensely about buildings like the John Coltrane House or the Henry Minton House. Um, and you, you care about them not just because of the lot that they sit on, but because the building itself is, is a compelling thing uh, and, and speaks to you and speaks to people who go on your tours and maybe has a kind of capacity for storytelling, uh, or at least I guess you could say as a prop for storytelling uh, that, that an empty lot doesn't. Uh, so can you talk about that a little bit? Well, sure. Um, so back to 1409 Lombard Street, the Billy Holiday Historical, which is Billy Holiday Historical marker is, is located. So when I went beyond the marker, 
what did I discover? That not only again is the Douglas Hotel still there, still there, that the Douglas Hotel was listed in the Green Book. And you may be aware of the Green Book. It was a travel guide that was published from um, 19, 1936 to 1966. It was a travel guide to help African-American Black travelers navigate Jim Crow laws in the South, but also racial segregation in the North. And Philadelphia was very much racially segregated. And so, so here you have, so then I, so that got me interested in finding out more about the Green Book. And lo and behold, there are lots of Green Book sites in Philadelphia still standing. But the Douglas Hotel is such a special place because what happened in the basement. Now the, 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 the folks who work at the Douglas Hotel, again, it's, it's, um, it's a nonprofit agency. They were kind enough after I begged, they were kind enough to let me in to see the the um, the um, basement, the the lower level, and there's nothing there. It's just white walls in the other office, but that basement must have been a magical space because for more than thirty years, a jazz club was located in the basement and under different names. And every jazz great of that era performed in, in the basement of the, um, of the, Douglas, of the Douglas Hotel that, that I, I, I often use this image of in the 50s, you had um, Sid, Sidney Bechet, a legendary clarinetist from New Orleans. He recorded a live album in that basement in the 1950s. In the 1960s, that same basement, now in the 1950s, it was known as Rendezvous Club. Fast forward to the 1960s, John Coltrane records a live album in that same space. Now it's called The Showboat. Fast now into the 1970s, Grover Washington Jr. records a live album in that same space now known as the Bijou Cafe. Some of you all may remember the Bijou Cafe. So the Douglas Hotel, that building is so magical because of the people who stayed there like Aretha Franklin and, and what happened in that, um, in that um, basement space. So, all right, I, I, I will stop. Uh pushing you on bricks and mortar versus uh, versus the abstraction of, of well, music. When you talk about bricks and mortar and historic um, preservation, this is where you get into this systemic racism that 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 the 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 criteria for for historic designation, the seven um, um, historic integrity test the seven criteria. Right off the bat, places associated with African-American history or culture would be, would not meet two of the um, seven standards right off the bat. When you talk about material, when you talk about design, the spaces that, the places, the buildings that are associated with African-American history and culture were never meant to be preserved. The people were never meant to be preserved. The, we were supposed to, at the end of slavery, the emancipation, we were supposed to just somehow disappear, but we're still here. And so the buildings associated with African-American history and culture are now um, tested by the same standards of, of slaveholders and their descendants. And so here you have the same test being applied to buildings associated with slaveholders and buildings associated with the descendants of, 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 of slaves who were owned by those very um, slaveholders. And so this, the deck is already stacked 
against um, again, properties associated with black history and culture. Because as you all know, the built environment reflects racial inequities. And so, it's, so you can't look at these buildings. Can you pull up the slide, please, um, the, with the collages? You can't look at these buildings and hold them by the, um, by the same standard. I'm not into um, poetry at all, but there's a poem by, um, um, Clint by um, Clint Smith, who's a writer with um, the Atlantic, I guess, have recently got his PhD in something at Harvard. So he has um, a collection of poems, Counting Descent, um, that the collection was published in, in 2016. And one poem, Believe me, it's short. I'm, again, I'm not, it's only two lines. I'm not into um, poetry at all. So um, his poem, Canon, and this is it. Our stars weren't meant for their sky. We have never known the same horizon. So our stars, the places that hold our stories were never meant to be judged by the same standard as the founding fathers, as the founding fathers, slaveholding founding fathers. And, and so it's not lowering the, 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 um, the test, the standards, it's, it's, it's dealing with the reality that, that these places were never intended to be preserved, saved, but, but still, but here they are. And so here we have, we have Oscar <laughs> with us. Hi, Oscar. And so here you have this collage that the three buildings, the three properties um, were subjected to the historic integrity test. Two out of three made it. <laughs> the um, Betsy Ross house, you see the before and after. Um, what is that? Um, the property of South Third Street. You see the before and after. Those two properties are listed on the Philadelphia Register of Historic Places. We get to the Henry Minton House, which was nominated by Oscar. So this house, Henry Minton was an elite um, caterer. As W.E.B. Du Bois described him, he helped the black community to, um, significantly, that he was a role model. He was an abolitionist that, that the Henry Minton house is one of the last places that John Brown laid his head before the Harpers Ferry um, raid. So by any measure, the Henry Minton house is a uh, historical significance. Yet the 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 um, the committee on his on historic designation in in the unanimous vote recommended that the commission add the Henry Minton House to the local register. A unanimous vote. The committee the commission ignore the unanimous, unanimous vote of his own committee on historic designation and deny protection to the Henry Minton House. Again, one of the last places that John Brown stayed. As an elite caterer, he, his, he lived there and his, he had a restaurant there. So he hosted, the, as they said, he hosted the great men of the day. Frederick Douglass. There's this iconic Civil War recruitment poster. Most of the men who signed the poster, their stories, this 204 South 12, 12, South 12th Street hold their stories. But none of that mattered to the, um, to the commission because it lacked historic designation. Um, I'm sorry, it, um, in integrity. So you see the, um, the 204 South, South 12th Street from the, the black and white photos from I think like the 1970s. You see it, you've probably seen it walking down 12th Street if you're not, if you were not even a member of the 12th Street gym. You see it with the um, sign 12th Street gym 
in that um, in those um, steps. But what what the building has been demolished. But what the demolition showed the lie that those changes were not reversible. You can see, you see the brick, you, you see the window pattern. That building about to be demolished is more recognizable than the, Be the Betsy Ross house or this property in, in, um, in Society Hill. So if I can just jump in for a, a second there, I, I think uh, these are nice examples of, of what you're talking about. And for those of you on, on this uh, meeting who are not familiar with the, the integrity standard, this comes out of the language of, of the National Register and ultimately the National Park Service. And as the name would suggest, integrity prioritizes the physical intactness of original fabric. Uh, and in, in um, many cases, as, as Faye is underscoring, um, Buildings associated with African American history tend to be built out of less permanent materials, and so they are uh, disproportionately subject to uh, demolition because of the changes that have happened to them. That actually isn't true of the Henry Minton House, which was a, a brick building to begin with, and then had, uh, after Henry Minton's day, the facade redone during a kind of uh, que Queen Anne uh, fashion update, I guess you could say. But as is often the case during demolition, um, you can begin to see that the older facade was there. Uh, and that happens time and again in, in, you know, in, in cities across the country, but in Philadelphia in particular, where the integrity argument is made, the building lacks integrity. Sure enough, as demolition proceeds, there's the thing that supposedly was gone forever. Uh, it, it is also worth pointing out that um, the, part of the reason that the designation committee felt comfortable recommending a building like this for the local register is that the integrity criterion is actually not officially something that uh, the Strahl Commission is supposed to be considering. It's a national criterion uh, coming out of the national register. Uh, it is not part of a, a set of criteria that are officially uh, being weighed uh, by the Committee on Historic Designation or necessarily by the Historical Commission itself. Uh, so this, this standard often gets trotted out as if it had uh, the sort of universal weight uh, to it. But in fact, there's a fair amount of, of flexibility on, on this issue locally. And again, uh, it, it can be used rather selectively uh, to demolish a building like the Henry Minton House when, as Faye's other examples show, uh, houses that have changed quite a bit either in terms of context or in terms of their facade composition uh, get preserved uh, anyway. So uh, Faye, thank you for that. And also for mentioning the work of, of Oscar Beisert uh, and to which I would also add uh, Jim Duffin. Uh, uh, both of them have been really, uh, I would say uh, at the forefront of getting uh, buildings uh, associated with African-American history designated a recent, uh, relatively recent triumph being uh, the William Still House, the existence of which uh, wasn't even known until the two of them uh, began digging into it. So uh, a shout out to others who have been undertaking this work at the at the front lines as well. Um, let's see, Faye, anything else you want to, to talk about while this image is up? Well, while the image is up, well, it's not over. <laughs> 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 it's not over the um the um 204 south south um 12th street was um a complex of three structures that were bundled together for tax purposes um but the henry minton house is the only one that has that exact that specific address so midwood a new york city based developer um Midwood demolished it. And, and it was clear that at the commission hearing that if the Henry Minton House were not designated, that it was the commission was sending this underground railroad. I won't say site because don't know whether um, he actually um, provided shelter to the self-emancipated, but, um, but this, property associated with the underground 
Railroad that they knew that if it were not designated, it would be demolished. And um, so again, the um, the building has been demolished, but Midwood has has um, has a conditional permit to build denser. They they use the affordable the affordable housing um, credit no, credit mm -hmm. right. They're not going to build affordable housing on site. They've, they've um, donated pennies to the um, housing trust fund. So they use the um, affordable housing credit, the um, the commercial, there'll be a commercial space on the first floor. So they use, so three credits. So the um, affordable housing, commercial space, and the third credit is public art bonus. So I thought, oh, oh so this is well, I will get them. And the um, Oscar knows all too well, the, um, um, the Midwest lawyer who will go a name at the moment, he said about a year or so ago, I am done talking about the, the Minton house. Um, done talking about Henry Minton. I just thought, oh, he may be done, but I'm not. And so with the public art bonus, um, the, um, on the on the building adjacent to the um, Henry Minton House, there was this beautiful mural of Gloria Ciceres, and so that's been demolished. And so, with the public art bonus, as you know, is one percent for a site specific um, public art. And so, what they proposed to do was to not recreate that mural, but to keep her legacy in public memory. And, and I made it clear to, to, they were negotiating with Mural Arts and I made it clear that if Mural, if um, Henry Minton was not included in their proposal, well, I'll do what I do. <laughs> and so they, they um, entered into an agreement where Henry Minton was not included. And of course I knew, well, I'll see you at the art commission, but but for whatever reason, I have, I, I think they demolished the mural um, before the actual, no, I'm sorry, whitewashed the mural before the actual demolition, because I think that seeing her face on the ground is far more traumatic than seeing the whitewashed. And so they whitewashed the, um, the mural and then all hell broke loose. So the agreement they had entered into with a mural arts is now null and void. And now Midwood says, we will, we will talk about, we will include Henry Minton. And we have, we meaning the stakeholders of the allies who recognize the intersectionality of this complex, not just black history, not just um, gay and lesbian history, but also immigrant history, Jewish history with the um, spa. So we set up um, a, website, a website, stopmidwood.com. Please go there, stopmidwood.com to find out more information because at some point they'll have to come back to the same community that they have inflamed, now outrage to sign off on this public art bonus. And so the, the building is scheduled to be completed maybe summer of 2023. 20, um, so, so perhaps they think that the outrage will no longer be there. Obviously, they don't know, they don't know the life of an activist. So we are just lying in wait. I tell them, um, again, via Twitter, mm -hmm. that you can build your little shiny cookie cutter apartments, but without that public art um, agreement, you will not get your certificate certificate of occupancy. So this story is far from over. All right. Well, that's <laughs> good to know. <laughs> and and uh, I, I would like to say that our uh, conversation is far from over too, though I see we are fast uh, running out of time. I, I did have oh. one more question for you, though, which it, it seems to me is is inherent in a lot of the stuff you said so far, shifting a little bit from the content of what you focused on to the, the medium. Um, how do you feel about uh, so social media as a as a preservation advocacy tool 
versus uh, other options. I'm thinking in part about the origins of the preservation movement, especially uh, the mid 20th century origins where you know people would gather petitions, which I guess we still do online, but they would also periodically have uh, rallies or demonstrations or find other ways of getting uh, public attention, which for whatever reason doesn't seem to happen anymore. Uh, I'm thinking as recently as the Lit Brothers store uh, in 1980s Philadelphia, there was there was real sort of uh, public um, public outrage expressed at the possibility of losing this building. And to the extent that that kind of response now happens, it seems to be mostly online. So I'm just curious what what your thoughts were about uh, the kind of most effective tools uh, for for getting people to care about these things. Well, no, people. First of all, people do care that that I've I've been I've moved to Philadelphia ten or eleven years ago, and once I'm now focusing on historic buildings. I wonder, I, I've asked myself so many times, where is Philadelphia's Jackie Kennedy Onassis? You all may know she's almost single-handedly saved Grand Central Terminal. So where are the social lights that Jackie Kennedy was able to mobilize? Because in this city, speaking out comes with risk that folks are quick to, to retaliate, that I'm able to speak out the way I do is because I work in, in DC. And so the usual ways that folks are retaliated against, they can't do it with me because you know what they do, they try to get you fired, they try to yank a contract, deny you a grant. Well, I don't apply, well, I have applied for grants, local grants, um, not not been successful, I haven't been applied in a while, but that's how they keep folks control. So people do care. I know they care because they tell me. Now I'm a lifelong activist. And so getting mad with me, saying bad things about me is like water on a duck's back. It's not going to, to, um, to deter me. So I'm motivated by passion, but it's passion that's, that's public policy informed. And that's what makes people so mad because I tell them I have receipts. I'm not making this stuff up. And so I use social media because it works. Their politicians at every level hate to be called out. So that's what I do. I call them out. And it doesn't always work, but a good example is with um, Pinrose, the developer that demolished the um, tribute to John Coltrane, Muro. I think that Penrose coupled with a person who has <laughs> the ability to make Penrose see the light, they just got sick and tired of hearing me talk about the, the mural. So it, it works. And of course, the most recent example with the, um, with the um, John Coltrane house that after the notice of demolition was posted, of course, not every day, but every almost every hour on the hour, I was tweeting about it because the notice said that demolition would, be, would begin on or about March 10th. And so, you know, I have, I have filed, I submitted a right to know request, but you know, the city routinely asked for 30 days. And so it would be 60 days before I would get a response. And so had to make noise, get the attention. And, and, and you can't deny social, it works. That's why people use it because it, it works. And a lot of folks, when you see the comments as you, as you do on Facebook, Instagram, and it really to a lesser extent, Twitter, that that they share information there, but they don't go the next step, which is to get involved offline because they know to get involved offline comes with risks. So that's why it's so important to reach out to folks who care about these issues and they do care and allies, and I'll give um, an example of allyship that you may be remember, 
I guess the the big fight stops um, with with the coronavirus. I've lost track of, of times. So I don't know what happened a year ago or two years ago. But in any case, the fight to stop Temple University from building uh, a football stadium, and they thought we would go away. It was um, two women, two black women in North Philly and who were really driving the group that came to be known as the Stadium Stompers, that even though they were told over and over and over, you're just wasting your time, it's a done deal. They were passionate about not allowing this 35,000 seat um, stadium to be built in the middle of a black community. Long story short, there is no stadium and there will likely never be a stadium because what these activists did, they saved Temple from building a $125 million hole in the ground. And of course, they, they Temple will not thank them, has not thanked them. They're still scoring people like with me, people see them come in and quickly walk to the other side of the street. But one of the women involved with stadium stompers 20 years ago, she was also involved in the fight to stop Temple from demolishing the Baptist Temple. Um, and they won that fight. Temple University was so angry that when the local chapter of AIA wanted to present Temple with an award for the Baptist Temple, they refused to accept the award. So the same property that Temple University wanted to demolish is now their crown jewel, the Performing Arts Center. But, but, but of course, they will never thank the local activists for stopping them from their own um, stupidity. Um, so did I answer your question? <laughs> uh, in, in part. <laughs> And um, oh, 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 the importance of, of allies, because you, the professionals, now I'm a professional, I'm not a historic um, preservation I'm a professional, but I'm very much a professional. So for you who have the knowledge that to reach out to, to the community, to allies, because they do care, but they have been beaten down and convinced that everything is a done deal, nothing you do will make a difference. And if you speak out, harm might, I don't mean physical harm, but harm might come, economic harm might, might come to you. So there are folks who are interested in saving these places. I hear from them all the, um, all the time. Oscar can tell you all about how many requests he gets from community members. So allies are so important because they may be in a position to speak out when you can't. So that's that's great. And I appreciate you underscoring, first of all, something that sometimes is, is not said in Philadelphia, which is that people actually really do care about this. And that when they see yet another building being demolished that they care about, I think the natural tendency is to despair and then maybe ultimately to sort of self-protection through apathy. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, that shouldn't be taken to mean no one cares. It means that a lot of people have tuned out because they've been burned too often. Uh, that's, that's a different thing. So I appreciate you, you pointing that out uh, directly. Let me tell you, um, Philadelphia has a rich jazz history that has not been documented. And so when I launched all that Philly jazz in um, 2013, it really, um, all that Philly jazz stems from a hackathon at Drexel University. We had a music related hack day, uh, hackathon music hack day, I think it was called. And, and so I decided then not to focus on musicians, but to focus on places. And so now and I'm out again, I'm, I'm not from Philadelphia. So these places are, I've never been with um, a handful. I've never been to any of these places. And so now and I'm out documenting, um, taking photos. And so I cannot tell you how many times as I'm standing in front of a, build, a building or maybe even a vacant lot, because again, they hold the spirit. Somebody will come up to me and almost say, thank you. Finally, someone is doing, they care about this history. And so they would share their stories because they, they know 
because the history has not been documented, that it lives in the memories of those who were there and that they have to share these stories while they're still here because when they're gone, those stories are gone. And so folks were so, were so helpful. I, I, um, one time I was standing at the corner of 15th and Ridge, you know, getting all emotional. This used to be the blue note. And someone, again, I'm making assumptions based on what the, um, the building looks like. And then someone walked up to me and said, no, the blue note was not there. It was across the street, which is down a, um, a vacant lot. And so folks do care. And so when you get out and you talk to people, meet them where they are, you will be surprised to, first of all, know how much they know and how much they care. Yeah. I, now, let me give you another example. Um, that there are few um, buildings still standing associated with um, with Philadelphia's jazz um, history. One is not too far from, is in uh, West Philly, Club 421. Building is still there. It was listed in the Green Book. Not only is the building still there, the sign is still there. Some of the letters are missing, but the sign is still there. You go inside the the Nothing has changed since the 1940s. So if you go there today, you can sit in the same booth that Billie Holiday sat in, walk up the same steps that she walked up to, um, to take her place on the stage. Um, so that's Club 421. There's um, a building in, um, in Shawswood, um, 2125. Ridge Avenue. So when, um, you know, when, when you're familiar with the section 106 process, when federal monies um, are involved, you have to um, do a survey to make sure that no properties will be adversely affected. So when PHA, uh, Philadelphia Housing Authority's grand vision for, um, to, to reimagine Shawswood. So when they had the, uh, the presentation at the, um, you know, the regional office of, of HUD. So I went because I had gotten myself designated as a consultant, consulting party that you don't get paid for it, but as a consulting party. So I'm sitting there, and of course the room is packed with PHA's um, folks. So I'm sitting there, so they're going through the slide. And so one um, building after another, and in, in serious disrepair, not, no historical significance, you know, the little group, you know, no, 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 no. Uh, no historical significance, no historical significance. So then they got to 2125 Ridge Avenue, no historical significance. And I'm sitting there knowing that it was the former location of the Checker Cafe, that, that uh, Pearl Bailey worked there as a teenager singing waitress. And um, of course, PHA did not have a clue about that history and neither did the people in the room because it was packed with their folks who would agree with them. And so we began the section 106 review, long story short, the state and the federal advisory commit, um, commission agreed with me. So that building is still there. Now get this, well, you, you've seen what, what, what PHA is doing with um, Shaw's Wood, boring. The only one of the few buildings with any character is 2125 Ridge Avenue. And in their promotional materials, that's the building they use because it, it is, they use the back side of it because there's that beautiful mural Ridge on the rise with tells the storytelling uh, mural about Gerard College, the, mus the musicians, um, um, John Cole trained at Pearl Theater, and then hovering over it all is Pearl Bailey. So that's the building they, that they now use in their promotional materials. So if they had gotten their way, the building in that mural would have would have been would have been gone. But mm -hmm. the community they knew the history because the club, the Checker Cafe dated dates back to the 1930s, but it was a jazz spot under a different name, became the Checker Club 
um, sometime in the 70s, 80s. So there were people there who were very familiar with the Checker Cafe. And I, I have to tell you all this, that to have been a fly on the wall when I submitted my statement of, of significance, because I had an image on the cover and the image was, was uh, taken from a mural, um, a mural that was commissioned by the Percent for the Art program. So there's this panoramic mural in the Criminal Justice Center. And if you go there, I was on, I was on jury duty. And so you know, being bored and, and walking around, when I noticed the mural, I nearly fell out. The mural tells, well, it's 96 feet. So it tells a lot of stories, including Philadelphia's jazz history. So that showboat that I mentioned that was in the Douglas Hotel, that's depicted. It also depicted the Checker Cafe. And so when PHA said, oh, oh, it may have had significance because of its proximity to um, Cecil B. Moore back then it was Columbia Avenue because it was, it was um, close nearby what was known as the Golden Strip, but they had no idea that Ridge Avenue itself was an entertainment district. And that's what's depicted on the mural. So to have been, to have been a flyer on the wall when they saw that image. So, <laughs> right, quite so. so. So so as we begin to wrap up here, uh, let me first of all put to you a question that my colleague uh, Randy Mason put in, in the chat here. Uh, let's see, I'm backing up. Uh, Randy says, thanks for all your work and for this talk. In addition to your own advocacy and social media presence, what do you think are the most promising ways to change how preservation works in Philly? A grassroots movement, a new law, a new mayor, a council person who takes it on as an issue? We don't need a new law because as you noted, Aaron, this whole his historic integrity test is subjected, it's not even in the preservation ordinance. So you don't need a new law. You don't need a new mayor because remember before Mayor um, Kenny, as a city council person, he was very much supportive of historic preservation. You need, you need folks who care and they who, who may not care, but they can be made to care. And so that's why activism is so important. We have everything we need right now to hold developers accountable. We have everything except the will. And that their constituents can make them care about not just well, about a whole lot of issues, but historic preservation. Because they think they think that they think that their constituents don't um, care. Not, and they, right. they, they have this stereotype because you know Philadelphia is the poorest big city in the country, so a lot of the um, black neighborhoods are disproportionately impacted by demolitions because it's a legacy of redlining, and so we were forced to live in these neighborhoods, the same neighborhoods that are now gentrifying. So there's a disparate impact on preserving properties associated with black history and culture, but they can be made to care. And shaming, shaming works. Public shaming works. That's why people do it. Sharing information on, on Facebook works because it'll bring, it, it brings it to the attention of uh, folks who may, who may be willing to go to take it to the next step and go offline. So fair enough. And I, I think, um, you know, for, first of all, thank you for doing this fearlessly. I really appreciate that. And it's, it's, the, it's the central thing about your work that excites me in, in a city where fear, as you have said, often permeates the, the culture of preservation and gets people to stay quiet. Um, I have two other uh, quick questions to run by you. One involves uh, a, a, a person asking, how would you, how would you include memories uh, and experiences in new criteria 
uh, for preservation? Or do we need new criteria at all? Do we need broader criteria for preservation or is that we're not uh, using creatively the criteria that we have? Right. <laughs> that we don't need, we have what we need that the, the criteria for designation pretty clear that if a property meets the test of historic significance or cultural significance, that should be the end of the of the story. But no, they want to they take it to the next step because of their own conscious or implicit biases. They take it to the next step and impose this um, um, historic integrity test, which is not included in the ordinance. In the ordinance, so if they just follow the four letters, the four walls of the ordinance, we we would have saved we would have saved the um, for sure the um, the Henry Minton House. But oh, what what we do need is a, is a um, a demolition moratorium because what is it um, about two or three percent of the buildings designated. And you know, we have a whole lot of old buildings here. And so I know that they have a proposal out there to do a survey in the a, in a by and by, but at the rate they're going, there won't be much left to, um, to, um, to preserve. But let me just, because I hear this a lot in, in the past week or two, um, a lot about being fearless that it's not about being fearless, but I am a lifelong activist. So if I'm not, you know, I tell folks, I have a, a plate full of issues that I could work on, but be, I'm driven by my interest and my passion. This is what I'm passionate about. And the, the fearlessness to the extent there is any is that I grew up in Bedford-Stuyvesant that as a consultant, I, um, got caught in the bandit zone in Ethiopia with a, with a driver who didn't speak English. And you know, so we had to make it to the plane in two hours. It was a helicopter that was, the red was being shot down between the Kazakhstan and China border. And so with having those experiences and then to come here and be worried about what some politician is going to say, that's you, you have, I, I, you I have faced no greater fears. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, of course, of course. I, I, I give it zero, zero thought. But I know that you have to work with politicians. And so, but I really keep my distance um, from them. And so what I do is provide information to others who can stomach <laughs> the interaction. But I really do keep my... Um, um, distance from policy, from elected officials. Of course, as a public policy person, you're dealing with politicians all the time, but more accurately with their staff. But I really do keep my distance from elected officials. Last question from the chat. Do you know of initiatives in Philly or elsewhere of preservation advocacy groups collaborating with local elementary, middle, or high schools uh, to develop sections in history and social studies curricula? that incorporate local neighborhood landmarks of black history, jazz history, or civil rights history? Well, the short answer is no, but I forgot the name of the school, but there was, I think it was a middle school that, that put together the nomination for the MOVE historical marker. Right. And- um, That'd so be the Jubilee School. Was it Jubilee School? Yes. Okay, okay. So yes, yeah, so the young people did that. And I think, I don't know whether they are young um, or they were the contemporaries, but there's now going to be historical um, marker denoting the um, Frank Rizzo-led riot um, at the Board of Ed in the, in the 1960s. So there's going to be the historical marker there. But I don't know whether there's a program specifically, you know, targeting ch school children. Right, and I, I, I do know of, of some national efforts to do this, but nothing uh, really uh, cohesive. There, there, it sort of is, is dependent, I would say, on the initiatives of individual people. Um, and those initiatives sort of come and go. There was, uh, I think the closest thing we had locally to this uh, was actually the, the Mill Creek project that Ann Spurn was involved in 
uh, a while back. And I think there's great potential there for, for more of that kind of work. Oh um, yeah, that, that does remind me, the Mill Creek Community Center, some time ago, they had a jazz program um, for, for, for young people. I don't know what has become of them. Sure, you know, with funding is always an issue. So Micah, I'm gonna check in with you. Are we okay on time or is this the end? I think this is the end. We, this was a really wonderful talk. I learned so much. Thank you, Faye, and thank you, Aaron. Well, thank you. Thank yes, you thank you. Much. Thank you both uh, very much. And we'll have to do this again, I'm sure. Um, uh, let me also remind everyone who's on the call uh, on April 8th at 5.30 in the evening, Jack Pyburn will be joining us uh, from Atlanta to speak on the Philadelphia Police Headquarters past, present, and future. Um, Faye, we hope to see you there. Uh, again, thank you both, Aaron, Faye, uh, a real pleasure. Well, thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye.